helping you with Acorn and Riscos computing. Right, let's go cracking then. It's 7.45. So uh, me, this is the one that's waving. I'm Rick, um, the chairman, chairperson, whatever. I refuse to call myself chair. It's a piece of furniture. Um, so welcome to Wakefield in a virtual fashion um, from the comfort of your own homes. Um, if your homes aren't comfortable, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, try DFS. And that doesn't stand for disk filing system. So uh, yeah, let's let's crack on. We've got Robert Sproson of uh, LSR this evening. Um, I'll just remind me to put him in speak of you. So over to you, Robert. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rick. Um, well, uh, in fact, I think how long have we been planning this for nearly a year? I think it was probably something like February. The you originally invited me, and I said, ah, well, let's cast forward a little bit and make it June or something like that. I think it probably was, yeah. <laughs> ridiculous. But obviously, things didn't quite uh, didn't quite pan out for June, so uh, we we pushed it forwards again. As um, normally, I use the excuse of coming through uh, Wakefield because I know some people in uh, around Leeds and York, and then I also have relatives in Cheshire, so I can kind of make an in inverted triangle to come back to Cambridge. But this time, I haven't haven't even made it out of the CB5 postcode, so. Um, let's try doing it, doing it all remotely. So I will try if I just hold on and try and remember what my password is. Share my screen. Do, 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 do. That. That. And that. It worked in rehearsals. <laughs> yeah. I've just got to press enough buttons at the same time. Ah, host disabled participant oh. screen sharing. <laughs> Sorry, forgot to do that before I hand it up to Ruth. Ruth will have to do that. Silence. You there, Ruth? Sorry, I muted my mic. Oh, uh, it, yeah. Just a little down arrow to the side of share the screen share screen thingamajig. And it's under the um, advanced or something like that, or more options. You know, you muted. Aha. Oh, oh well, it's, um, it seems to be. Every time we see Ruth, she's got a different background. Have you got a personality problem, Ruth? <laughs> Story of my life. Ah, oh, that's better. There we go. It let, it let me press the buttons anyway. So, where's my mouse pointer gone? Right, there we go. Hopefully, through the power of the internet, there's a title page that says LSR at the Wakefield User Group. Let's go for that then. So, yeah, I, I've got three, uh, I have three topics to cover today. Um, the first, one, first two are relatively short. They're, they're more recaps from when I looked through my notes from when I'd last been to uh, Wakefield. So there's a couple of things uh, that I should mention before we get on to the, um, the larger topic towards the end, which is uh, applications. So uh, I, I never uh, make a big uh, song dance about this, I really must keep mentioning them, that uh, there are some AMCOG collections that you can buy uh, through LSR's website. Um, there are two to choose from. There's the Space Collection, which uh, comprises Protector, Xeroid, and Starmine. So it's three, three games within that one collection. Uh, and then uh, there's also the Puzzle Collection for Legend of Magic, Mop Tops, and Escape from the Arcade. Um, so both of these are uh, available for 19.99, uh, which comes on a little USB stick through the post uh, and includes uh, obviously all the great updates from uh, Tony at AMCOG. So I thought I, I really ought to keep mentioning these because they're, they're a bit hidden away on the website. So much so, in fact, that during the, the first round of lockdowns back in uh, earlier in the year, so May and June, uh, I ran a slightly uh, uh, ran a special offer where you could buy both collections together 
and then there was a £10 discount if you bought them both at the same time. And then I would donate that £10 to Médecins Sans Frontières, who are doing uh, obviously work around the world for countries where their health systems perhaps aren't quite as robust as the ones that we enjoy here in the UK. So uh, that's that picture there on the screen is actually a scan. They sent me a postcard through the post, very old school. They sent me a thank you postcard through the post uh, once that offer had finished at the end of June. So uh, thank you for everyone uh, that took part in that uh, special offer. So onto some less software, more hardware. Um, now, uh, I've developed a uh, Wi-Fi hat that uh, you can fit onto a Raspberry Pi. And uh, if you don't know what hat is short for, it, it is an acronym, as you could well imagine, hardware attached on top. So um, it's a little plug-in board that um, where the screw holes on the Raspberry Pi board are arranged relative to the GPIO header. And if I, yeah, I'm not sure how big that's going to be. So that's an, that's an example of a hat installed on top of a Raspberry Pi. Wait. So you end up with four. Um, you end up with four screw holes in the corners, and then it will fit on any Raspberry Pi that has a 40-pin header. So that's it's basically a, a standard that the Raspberry Pi Foundation have invented, um, so that all of your add-on boards are of a standard size, and you can still fit them in the standard cases, and the ribbon cables will all fit through the little holes in the board. Yeah. Robert, be be aware that if you hold something up to the camera while you're screen sharing, you're only Invisible, very small. Very yes, small, yeah. I, I, I can sh I can show it larger later. It's um, yeah. it's a uh, it's, it's a small version of the picture that is on the screen anyway. Um, and so uh, the uh, Wi-Fi hat uh, comes with a Ethernet driver. Now I'm being very careful with my terminology here because from RiskOS's point of view, it's got a wired Ethernet interface. So all of the normal applications. Aren't, shouldn't be or aren't aware that they're actually connected via Wi-Fi. That's all hidden away by this Ethernet driver. So um, although you're connected via Wi-Fi to your Raspberry Pi, if you look in the configure application, for example, this is what that screenshot is, um, RiskOS believes that it's talking to an Ethernet cable because that's what internally it understands. Um, and then so all applications like you know, web browsers and things, they're all unaware that secretly there's a, a wireless interface behind the scenes. So what does that look like? Yeah, um, I, I will show it once, um, once we've finished uh, screen sharing. I can show you a, a slightly larger version of it. Um, basically, that hat. Uh, on the screen is what it looks like. It's a little Wi-Fi module uh, called the Will C1000. Not very exciting. It's just a chip number um, soldered to the hat. Uh, you push that onto the 40-pin header, and then you install the Ethernet driver, which comes as a uh, Pling Boot uh, application upgrade. And then when you restart the computer, you'll see on the left-hand side uh, it gained a little Wi-Fi icon next to the uh, apps folder. If you middle mouse click on that, it will sh show you all of the um, uh, the Wi-Fi networks that are currently in range. Uh, and, and my network is the one that's called Just One More Thing, uh, so, and from which you can connect to that um, and optionally store the password so that when you next restart the computer, um, it will it will see if it's near your favourite network again and rejoin it automatically. Now, of course, within a few weeks of having released this, somebody pointed out that um, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a real-time clock interface. Um, and so they had been buying uh, little real-time clock modules that sit on that same 40-pin header, um, which then caused a problem because if you want to have Wi-Fi at the same time, you then no longer had anywhere that you could plug your, um, uh, plug your real time quantum because the the way that the 40 pin header the definition the the hat definition means that you can't stack them up like stickle bricks um it's a bit like a um a bit like say the tube interface on the bbc micro uh, you could only ever have one thing plugged in at a time unlike say the one megahertz bus interface on the bbc micro where you could daisy chain several things together so the definition of the hat is that you can only have one hat fitted at a time 
Um, so that led a few weeks later to uh, hurriedly adding a real-time clock chip. So the bit in the red uh, circle, hurriedly adding a, a real-time clock chip so that people could then have both um, Wi-Fi and the real-time clock add-on at the same time. So that was my uh, recent foray into uh, adding Raspberry Pi hats. We can go back to software. So uh, tonight I will be showing, and in fact, uh, this presentation is being displayed by um, TextEase, which is a, a suite of applications that were written by a company called SoftEase originally, so Danny and uh, Jeff. Um, and they were originally trying to target it for um, a uh, the junior and secondary school uh, education market. And as a result of that, it's got a really intuitive user interface. So all of the applications, um, I have been over the last few weeks uh, capturing various screenshots showing uh, how to use all of the software. And uh, uh, quite a lot of the time, I realized that the words that I'm writing, uh, they're just obvious. It's, uh, they're, it's they're really nice applications to use because everything is very obvious how to use. You think, oh, I, I need to drag some text from there to there. How do you do that? Oh, well, you just pick it up and drag it, of course. So uh, they're, they're really intuitive, really nice user interface to use. Um, and that was the, the principle behind their company when they call it softies. Uh, and in fact, their, their current company is called Just Too Easy. They've got a, they've got a great thing about using the word easy is everything uh, is, is uh, very intuitive to use. So uh, in, the, uh, in the suite of applications, um, there's the desktop publisher. That's the main uh, application, which I guess uh, you would think of like a, looks like a glorified word processor. Um, there's a paint application, which um, for drawing and uh, artwork, so with a variety of uh, brushes and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a spreadsheet application um, for entering data, doing simple analysis, and then charting and plotting it, you know, to try and visualize it. Um, and then presentation add-on, which is the thing that's uh, currently showing uh, these sets of slides. And then the ones that I won't dwell on this evening is a turtle uh, and branch uh, application as well. So the turtle is um, for anyone who can program in logo. I don't know if you remember having a little turtle wandering around on the carpet at school. Um, so the, the turtle add-on is a software version of that. And then uh, branch is um, for classifying uh, object. So again, it's more of a, a tutor, a, a learning tool rather than a, um, a desktop productivity tool. So I'll, I'm going to skip those two later. So yeah, um, the DTP program um, opens a blank white sheet of paper, as you probably would expect for, um, for writing uh, text. Uh, it has all of the features that you might expect from a, a word processor. So you can uh, enter text, uh, change the style, the font, the color, uh, rotate the text, all of those sorts of things. Um, if you're writing things like a newsletter or a newspaper, you can uh, draw arbitrary rectangular frames, connect those frames together, and then the frames uh, will flow the text around uh, in the order in which you've connected them. So for example, if it was a three column newspaper, um, you could just keep typing, 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 and it will fill the second and third columns automatically. Uh, for the Acorn native file type, so sprites and draws, uh, if you control double click on a picture that you've included, it will then go and open it back in paint and draw so you can edit it or touch it up. And then when you save it, it will automatically update the underlying document. Uh, it has a spell checker. Uh, and also a thing uh, called the word bank. So uh, a word bank is useful when uh, you have a lot of very commonly used phrases. So um, marketing boilerplate, or um, if you're perhaps a, I don't know, uh, well, in fact, I saw a Doctor Who fan. Yes, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you could have a lot of uh, common Doctor Who themed words in your word bank. So you don't have to keep trying to work out how to spell Silurian, uh, you can just have ah, yes, double, double click on Silurian and it will type it in for you for your frequent Doctor Who usage. Um, the pages uh, can be up to nine meters as it says there uh, and then slightly off to the side there's a, a undo and redo button um, with infinite levels of re undo and redo. Well, 
in practice it's limited by amount of memory on your computer but as we all have hundreds of megabytes of free memory at the moment uh, it's a practically infinite undo and redo feature and then if you have uh, eSpeak installed uh, for example as comes with um, Pluto the email uh, the uh, the pair of lips there lights up in uh, red and it will speak back the paragraphs to you so and that's quite useful it's, it sounds uh, sounds a bit corny but it's quite useful uh, if you're a visual reader as as i am where you don't really look at the actual words written as you're scanning the page you're you're looking at the shapes of the words it's very easy to miss spelling mistakes mis spelling mistakes so often i will get from and form mixed up because what i'm actually doing when i'm proofreading it is i'll just see the letter f and then I will skip over the rest of the word because I know from the context it probably should be from. So I, I will skip the, skip the actual spelling of the word. So quite often, if you receive something from me where I've mixed up from and form, I apologise now. Um, if you play it back or get it to be read back to you, it's a lot more obvious than if you if when you're scanning scanning reading things. Now uh, you can drop graphics uh, into the. Um, DTP as well, a um, variety of formats. So JPEG for photographs, uh, draw, draw and sprites, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, now, I doubt that it's coming out very well over Zoom because I, uh, I did try this the other day. There should be a smoothly animated bunny rabbit walking just near where my mouse pointer is, but um, Zoom was mangling that quite badly when I, I tried it out. So It's um, not bad. It's, it's just, not bad at all. Okay. It's moving. <laughs> that's, that's the main thing. Oh, definitely moving. Um, so uh, yeah, so animated GIFs, for example, are supported. So you, your, I guess what I'm trying to say there is the document doesn't have to be flat, dull, and static. You can have moving or interactive elements embedded in as well. And then if you have the complete animator, which is a animation package from RComp, uh, it will also play back ACE films as well. So you can put um, short animations or movies in your uh, TTP as well. Uh, there's also the picture bank and the picture bank is a glorified directory viewer really so if you have a lot of again commonly used images so let's go back to the doctor who analogy so if you've got pictures of daleks and uh, the tardis for example then you might reasonably put that into a picture bank of your frequently used graphics so that you can quickly drag those in you can wander off and go and find them from the risk filer as normal and drag those in as well but for the for the ones that you commonly use it's quite useful to be able to group them together in, in a clip art gallery so very briefly on to the, um, the paint application so this has a, a selection of brushes and um, pencils crayons uh, spray cans watercolor paints that sort of thing these are all effects for making uh, marks on paper um, so you can pick the color as well uh, and pipette it from anywhere else in the RISC-OS desktop. So if you've got another application that you're trying to color match a particular thing to, you can wander off outside Texties and pipette color from that and then start painting in that color in your, in your application. So uh, if I go and do it live, uh, you know, I can scribble on my own presentation halfway through a presentation. Uh, admittedly, I'm not very good at drawing and I did just use a, a blue marker pen, but uh, you can apply uh, graphics uh, on the fly or on top of other text. So you can freely mix. If, you, if you've started drawing an image, you can freely mix um, text with that and vice versa. So then the, uh, the table add-in. Uh, that is uh, what I would count as a, a reasonably simple um, spreadsheet application. So it's not, uh, it doesn't have, for example, a solver like you might expect in, in Excel or, or um, uh, Fireworks Pro, for example. Um, but if you want to do things like min and max, average, um, trigonometry, that sort of thing, adding up sales figures is what I was doing here. So sales figure by region. Um, you can enter uh, your, your data relatively simply and quickly produce um, a variety of charts from that. So I've drawn a pie chart here, very exciting, but, um, you can do bar charts, scatter, scatter charts, that sort of thing. So again, it's, it's 
mainly a plugin for illustrating your document. So if you've been writing text saying how good this year's sales were, you might quickly want to stick in uh, a pie chart reflecting what you've said in, in the text. And then the present portion of Texties, uh, this is what I'm, I'm presenting this in. Um, you essentially you design each of the slides as though they were just a Texties document. So um, I can, when I finish this, I'll, I'll break out and I can show you that uh, more, more directly. Um, so all of the tools and facilities that I've already just mentioned from the other applications can all be stitched together. So you can include animations, you can draw, include drawn pictures and paintings, you can show text, all that sort of thing. Uh, you can have transitions between the slides. So um, again, it, it may not come out great over Zoom, but here um, I'm using just a fade transition. There are various wipes and, and star wipes to, to switch between the, the different slides. Uh, you can even have sound effects. So if you want a sound of a smashing piece of glass or something or an explosion as you change between slides, you can um, tie the event of changing the slide to the sound effect. So when you click the mouse, it launches the sound effect. And then there's a gallery view, uh, which is what uh, is on the right hand side of my slide there, where you can see the summary of the story so far. And if you suddenly think, oh, well, actually, I've already talked about the Wi-Fi hat before, let's get rid of those slides. You can just quickly delete those from the deck uh, and leave the rest of the uh, presentation intact. So all together, um, these sets of uh, applications, they're all um, behind the scenes written in C, so they're all 32-bit compatible. Um, they also work on RISC-OS 3 and 4 as well, if you want. Um, and uh, as with most of the software that uh, LSR sells, uh, what you actually get is an installer application, and then the installer will download the latest version from LSR's website. So um, if there's then a subsequent update, you just rerun the installer, and then it will download that latest copy again. Um, so you can always be sure that you are up to date with the latest version. And then within that, um, there are three subcategories. So the most common one that I think people will be using is the home version, which is the DCP, so in other words, the, the, the word processing aspect and the painting program. Uh, slightly more uh, used is the educational version with the turtle and the branch add-on. And then the full package with all six applications uh, is the professional version, which is the one that I'm showing with the uh, the presenter here. So I didn't want to uh, bamboozle you too much with hundreds and hundreds of slides. So uh, hopefully that's been a, a good overview since I was last over in uh, in Wakefield. And over to the floor if there are any questions or if you want me to uh, demonstrate anything that I can do interactively. Uh, cool. Just a quick question, uh, Robert. Um, do you guys have any discount for previous uh, customer of taxis? Uh, so I, I have done that with um, with Profit and the other uh, and uh, Font Directory Pro, the other applications that I've taken on. At the moment, I I haven't done, but that's only because the last release uh, Texties was in 2002 when I wasn't quite sure how many people after 18 years were still using it. So I'm I'm very receptive to if, if there's a big wave of previous Texties owners, then uh, I'll definitely add an extra option for um, a previous user, but I haven't done it at the moment. Thank you. They're on a similar uh, Facebook page, Robert, uh, I've got a copy of Texties studio which um was like you done um you know it was like uh, it didn't actually have a couple of the modules i think it was probably the uh, the branch and tersely yeah um so would there be a subset of upgrades i.e you know it rather than um rather than going because step, uh, when studio and text these come out it was rather like you had it was like 
you either had textiles, you then went up to textiles and something else. So would you consider modularizing the upgrades as well? Yeah, so I've, I've tried to simplify um, the, the possible options only from an administrative point of view, not from a technical, <laughs> no, no technical reason behind it. Um, so yes, there, used, there was Textease 2000 as well. You, you, that might be the one that you're trying to remember. And then yes, there was an educational uh, oriented one and then just Textease Studio. It, it got renamed along the way quite a few times. So I've tried to simplify it in the groups that I think. Um, so what, uh, what Softies used to do is that you could at some time that you wanted to change, um, you could get a, a access code or something like that, type in the access code, and then that would then upgrade you. Um, since we have the internet now, uh, there didn't seem to be any point in, in maintaining the access code on a piece of cardboard through the post model, mm -hmm. since uh, if you were to do an upgrade, then you could just download the, the fuller copy from, uh, from LSR's okay. website. So that's the tack that I've gone with. So. Yeah, if, if you started out with the home edition and then subsequently decided you wanted the educational edition, then I would only want the £15 difference. It, it wouldn't be uh, that you would have to start again from scratch. In a similar vein, um, if you've got an old version, say Textile Studio, and you wish to upgrade to a full pack, would there be a, a sort of halfway house price? Oh, what bless is two, two out of two. My uh, my market research obviously wasn't hot enough when I I thought no one will still have it after after eighteen years. I won't bother with the upgrade path. No, two out of two people have asked for upgrades. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've used it. I've used it at some uh, mug meetings as well, and and we actually used it at some of the mug shows to to do a revolving display. Yes, so the, the, the presenter can go on an infinite of... loop. Yeah, the last version 5.93, I think had one or two issues, but um, I think animator wouldn't work. Um, um, but um, that that worked really well. So um, yeah, it's it's a fantastic re-edition back to the library of programs that we've got. Yeah, there were a few um, a few of the um, players and things weren't 32-bit compatible, so um, I had to um, chase after. A, the um, the complete animator one and uh, there's an audio player that um, that also needed a, a bit of work. So yeah, some of the external players at the time were not 32-bit compatible. So I've I've updated those as well, and then additionally um, Textees. So there have also been a few bits and bobs behind the scenes needed. So uh, for example, the the zero page relocation in RiskOS 5. Uh, exposed a few uh, null pointer bugs that had been hiding in the previous version of Textees. So yes, if you were to try running old Textees on new RiskOS 5, you'd probably find it would uh, it would crash occasionally if it was um, if it hit a null pointer exception. So yeah, there've been a, a raft of fixes along those lines as well. I think I know Robert. My I'm very pleased to see this product come back. Um, I haven't really got a question. My, my, my version is very old indeed. It's from the 90s. Uh, oh, and I didn't pay for it. I was a beta tester for Jeff and Danny. Um, and in fact, they both worked for me at IBM. Oh. <laughs> they, they, they were both they were contractors. I, I employed them both because I was some sort of development manager. And they came along and wanted a job. And I was in a position to give them one. And they worked um, on Visualizer, it was called, in IBM. And uh, Jeff bought an A4, I think it was an A4, little little laptop with a black and white mono screen, Acorn A4. Yes, the he Acorn A4, yeah. Most of his software on that. And he asked me, and Dad, was marketing. <laughs> he was, so Jeff was developing, Dan was marketing at the time. And yeah. they gave me a copy of whatever they had, and I was a beta tester for a while. Oh, okay. It stopped working around about 2000 and I haven't used it since. And then, then it yes. went to Windows, Windows only at some point. I was very disappointed. Yeah, it, it has had a bit of a potted history. Um, so, uh, at, as you say, around 2000, um, it, it was, um, there's, there's an Apple Mac or 
contemporary with year 2000 Apple Mac version uh, and then there's a Windows 3.1 version which just about limps along on Windows 95 if you're lucky or Windows 98 if you're lucky um, but I think those bits of code or those libraries have, have probably fallen far enough into uh, oh Doug has Doug, Doug has uh, found, found and Paolo has also found his uh, that's, His box set from uh, yeah, pr proof of ownership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and this is uh, yeah, uh, that runs also on Windows. Yeah, oh yeah, it's got the Windows version. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at that point, are you in shortly touch? after that, um, sorry. Are you have been in, have you been in touch with Jeff recently? Uh, yes, yeah. Well, this, the, this is how I got the uh, the source code. Yeah. So. Um, uh, the, the slightly potted history after uh, the early 2000s was um, they sold the uh, the Texties applications to RM, so the, the educational supplier, uh, and they kept on, uh, I think they, they dropped the RISC-OS uh, version and carried on with the Windows version. And then sort of mid 2000s, they sold that to, uh, or sorry, they spun out a company called I think it's Lighthouse or something like that, but it was still you know, it was a, a rebrand of, of part of RM Educational. Um, so yes, it's, it's, uh, it's had a very potted history. So the, the more recent Windows version from RM, uh, I, I don't have, but uh, the RISC-OS version has survived. Hi Rob, uh, Peter Richmond here. Yep. Um, I actually uh, had a word with Jeff Titmus while I was developing the presenter bit of it, and uh, I too have, uh, I think, a 2002 RISCOS version of right, presenter yeah. <laughs> I've used a few times, and I think I've shown it at the Wakefield Club as well. Uh, one of the questions I was wondering is, uh, I think the older version used to be able to save as HTML. Is that still available? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, when you go to the save window, there's a variety of um, sub options of how you want to save it. So um, the, the first two are the Texties native format. So there's uh, Texties as a file and Texties as a template for future files. Then you can extract the text content uh, um, and then save it as draw or draw as a text area. So in other words, if you wanted to be able to edit it in draw. So if I uh -huh. uh, just quickly Go back to that. I can then zoom controls aren't in the way. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> so yeah. you can drag and drop uh, into uh, into draw. And if you hold on, excuse me. Let's see. I did uh, I did clean up the HTML a little bit. It was a bit flabby, but. Uh, Oh, there we go. No pointer reference. I've missed one. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> There's always one. But, live but yeah. Demos. <laughs> yeah, it's a danger of a live demo. Uh, right. So yes, uh, it, it can uh, export. That's, uh, I think it's because I'm dragging it via the uh, dragging it via the clip. Yeah, it's because I was going via the clipboard rather than uh, dragging it to a file and then loading it again. Right. So right. yeah. So yes, you can still yeah. export as uh, HTML as well. Yeah, yeah, very useful. Uh, I think I'll probably be buying that. Did you say there was a possibility of a discount uh, if we still got the original number box, whatever? Uh, it sounded like uh, if that's three out of three people asking, then uh, it sounds like I better go and add some buttons to the store. Yes, I, I hadn't added some buttons to the store to for the uh, existing owners because I thought, ah, 18 years, surely no one's still using it. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, okay. Robert, on, not, everyone is here is, Come on now. <laughs> not everyone here is from Yorkshire by any means, but yeah, you're, this is a Yorkshire club meeting, so you have to be like a Yorkshireman. I'm not paying that. I want a discount. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair enough. Yeah, as as, uh, as a tight-fisted northerner, I fully appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know my, what the definition of a Yorkshireman is, don't you? It's uh, short arms, deep pockets. A Scotsman with all the generosity stripped out. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> what? Yeah. Shit, I'm a Scotsman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're too generous. <laughs> too generous. Yeah. Uh, so that's available from uh, your uh, website, then, Rob. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right, uh, fantastic addition. As I say, I thought it was a brilliant programme when it was going anyway. Uh, I was disappointed to see it disappear, I think, as you say, post-2002. 
So, yeah, um, yeah. Thanks thanks every every part of it that I've been using uh, has been oh wow, it does that, and you, <laughs> I didn't oh, yeah, realize it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's uh, you know, it's got. If I quickly turn on the. If I'm apologize if I'm moving the windows around oddly, it's the, I'm just trying to avoid the zoom controls in the corner of the yeah. screen. <laughs> yeah. So you know, if I if I put a misspelling, oops. yeah. You know, and it will highlight it in. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, a real uh, uh, a real joy to be using. It's you just you keep finding features. And you think, oh, oh wow, they thought of that. That was a brilliant idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we started definitely with the the blank page, big sky <laughs> idea of what should we have. Well, yes, this, you can almost yeah. do, you can almost yeah. do like um, uh, talking books, storyboard type thing. Um, because that's what I did for my kids around mm -hmm. the wrist PC. I had this program. They used to come home with rocket, what they call rocket words. So you had a list of words. You could talk, you could talk to them. You could have an animation on there so that when they finish the list, off when a rocket or something like that. And you could also scan in pages of books and then actually write the words in. And so the early books that they, they used to read, um, I used to transpose the wrist PC and you could turn the pages as well back and yes. forth. It was great. Yeah, so the, there are various interactive features that you can. Uh, so uh, I, I've shown animations previously, but as you say, Doug, you can associate those um, with actions so you can make it. Um, sit and wait for you you know if it's if you put a calculation on the screen you say what what is five times two um you can then hide the answer until you have pressed a button for example so yeah reminds me very much of scratch in a funny sort of way um, yeah well, well yeah if, if you add the um the the logo uh programming the you know the turtle programming uh, in there as well uh yeah, because um, Rick Murray's got a program that uh, we used at the mug shows for um, uh, doing a little mapping USB robot. And it might, oh, yeah, might yeah. be good. But here's a development uh, opportunity, Rob, is to, uh, to try and add in some of that functionality so you could actually write the commands out to USB to actually control the USB type robot. Oh yeah, good idea. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, ah, and then I've got, I've managed to put that where the zoom window is again. Oh, let me move zoom out of the way. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, uh, if you were to control a turtle using the, I'm, I'm just using the keypad here, but you can turn that into logo, a sequence of logo commands in a procedure. Um, uh, and pre-program the zoom window popped up. Uh, yeah. Procedures. Yeah, so you can define yourself a uh, a set of procedures. Uh, for yeah, for example, controlling a robot. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Yeah. Because <laughs> you've got loads of spare time, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's capture some more screenshots. I think of all, of uh, of the turtle and the. Uh, and the um, branch additions. I, I haven't done the screenshots for the educational bits yet. It'll take a long time. What documentation is there for the program? Uh, so, uh, aside from it being almost trivially easy to use without documentation, um, there's a um, PDF manual which is uh, no. minus the bits that, as I say, I haven't done the screen captures for yet. Which is the um, so I've, I've done paint, DTP, and the reference section at the moment. And that's a 70-ish page manual. Um, so once the remaining chapters have been added in, uh, I'm expecting to turn that into a into a A5 uh, book in the same way that I have for the um, for Font Directory Pro and for Profit. Okay. So pl plenty of documentation to read. But as I say, as I've been capturing the screenshots, I keep thinking this is just so obvious. It's it's almost almost not worth writing the words because it's so obvious how to use it. It's it's really intuitive to use. 
Is it worth any of us that have the original to uh, do something with manuals, send them to you or something like that? Uh, so I, I, I have the manuals to, to work okay. from from uh, Jeff, yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, probably have to uh, run around for them, but yeah, I, I have the manuals um, from Contemporary 2000. The only drawback from my point of view of those manuals uh, are that a lot of the screenshots were from the Windows one. So you ended up right. with... Um, quite a lot of windows centric you know go to the file menu and you look at it well i don't have a file menu because it's risk OS, so i have a i have a menu i'll have a look and see if mine's i'll see if mine's an old risk OS one i really can't remember as you say most of it's so obvious you don't need to open the, the book in the first <laughs> place uh but yeah. if it is in risk OS thing uh, that would be, be useful to see an extra yeah. an extra one to see yeah yeah the, yeah the ones that i have from from jeff from early 2000s all have windows screenshots in them right yeah okay well i might go snail mail on that one if i do have it <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's fine okay i'll have a look as well rob all i can find at the moment is the uh the 2000 edition the um studio the swiss one okay yeah you've probably got that one haven't you yes that that is windows mac and and um Acorn, but my original one was Acorn only, and it was much, much fatter manual. But it's somewhere up in the attic. <laughs> yeah. Mine's quite a slim little book. Uh, Risk OS 3, it says. Oh, okay. So maybe yours, yours was pre the Windows version then. I suspect so, yes. Yeah. 90s. And it has a change of address at the back, moving oh. from Derby to uh, Ashbourne. Was that really yes. software? Really small software company. I think Jeff was selling from the really small software company at one point. Oh, in both cases, it's Softies. Softies, okay. Right. Yeah, they moved to somewhere, the, the vicarage or something like that in in Derbyshire or Derby. Yeah. The old courthouse. That might be it. Maybe I was thinking of getting vicarage and courthouses muddled up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah. You'll be moved in. A moved a couple of times. You get the vicarage and the courthouse mixed up, you're going to be in trouble when your case appears before the peak. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Probably a, a few historical. Uh, some vicars ended up in court accidentally. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Rick mentioned earlier when I was screen sharing that the uh, the picture of the uh, the hat might might come out a bit small. So hopefully, uh, if I'm now not screen sharing, let me see if I can tilt it in the light. Uh, you'll be able to see that a little bit bigger. So the hat is the board sitting on top, and the uh, pin your video. Yeah. Just pin pin right. And the chip there is the, uh, the oh, yeah. Wi-Fi chip. <laughs> Probably a, a bit easier to see. Oh, that's a, a familiar looking Raspberry Pi. They're a wee bit close to the camera. It's out of focus. Ah, okay, a bit harder. I'm trying, trying to catch it and see if I can catch it in the light. If you put one of those on a Pi 4, will that exacerbate the heat problems? Uh, so quite a few people have them on the Pi 4. Um, the hats all have a standard design where they're trying to allow airflow around it. Right. You, you wouldn't have space for a fan on the processor on a Pi 4 and the hat because they, the, um, the distance is only 11 millimeters between the two PCBs. So you wouldn't right. be able to squeeze a fan in, in between. Um, I know that um, Andy from Risk OS Bits has managed to do a side-on arrangement so that you can have the Pi 4, the hat, and then the fan is blowing sideways across the PCB. Yeah, I got a than... Pi hard from Mandy, so it okay. might, yeah, yeah. So ra rather than being in the same plane as the processor, yeah, you've put the fan on, on its side, as it were, so that you can circulate air um, the other way, even though you've got the hat fitted, yeah. Talking about the Pi's then, Rob, um... Pi 400, uh, does that sort of work with the Pi hat, uh, the hat that you've got? Uh, electrically and software-y, yes. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to qualify uh, 
because um, unfortunately the way the connector comes out on the back of a Pi 400 means that you end up with the hat. Um, how would I describe it? Yeah, it's, it's at right angles to the keyboard. Yes. Yeah, someone, someone put a picture of one of those on Twitter a while back, didn't they? Yeah, so I think, uh, again, that, that was uh, Andy at Risk West Bits. I think he's managed to find a right-angled connector so that if you had a Pi 400, you fit the hat through a right angle first so that it uh, appears in the same orientation as the uh, keyboard. But obviously, it's outside the case, so it's, it's kind of a flap. It's like a ZX Spectrum uh, RAM pack tacked on the back. Yeah, we could, probably Andy might come up with a Pi plus one or something <laughs> going yeah, forward. Some way of arranging it so internally or more internal so you can't fiddle with it. Yeah. So the, the hats are definitely intended to stack on top of you know in a sandwich with a normal pie so that when you put them in a, a pie's case you end up with something that you can't easily um, fiddle with and you know, get your fingers in. I see a question, I'm just looking at the chat, I see a question from Bernard. Um, so yeah, OLE, yes, OLE works with draw files and sprite files to answer your question. Uh, and who is maintaining the code now? Uh, LSR is. So hopefully that has answered, uh, answered Bernard's questions from the chat. Yeah, just coming back to the cooling uh, as an engineer, you know, if you want to keep a circuit board cool, you mount it vertically. But of course, <laughs> that's not how it's working. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I think the um, the risk rest bits case can be mounted on its side, so it looks like um, uh, like a, a letter a letter rack, you know, vertical slices. So uh, they're they're following that. So yeah, convection or convection always goes up and gravity always goes down. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very happy to uh, answer any other questions or. Um, show anything else that anyone wants to see in Texies? It, sorry, um, Rob. Um, Hi, Chris. The uh, presenter part, is there a limit on the file size or? Nope, nope, right. no check. Um, yeah, other than free RAM and uh, hard disk space, no. Um, so this presentation is 618K, frugal as ever. So, you know, it's got a, a reasonable set of pictures in it. There's some screenshots and text. So it's, uh, it's only come out a few hundred K. And I've got so yeah, 200, <laughs> yeah. A lot of memory spare, 2,040 megabytes free RAM, so uh, it's it's barely dented my uh, my titanium's RAM. Obviously, if you if you import large um, JPEG images, um, they end up adding to the file size because they're um, you can't really compress recompress a JPEG very well. So bitmapped images, um, like the screenshots that I've got get compressed within the file. So they save a bit of space that way, but a JPEG uh, won't get recompressed. So if you put a four megabyte photo in, you'll end up with a four megabyte larger Texties file than you started with. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, worth mentioning, thank you very much for bringing it to a 32-bit, Robert. That is definitely very cool. <laughs> ah, there we go. Well, I got an example of a, 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 um, a table of numbers. So yeah, if you want to take mm -hmm. the average of B4, to B9. So 
it's a, a spreadsheet um but not a fully fledged uh statistics or analysis package it's, it's definitely um, the in intention is to quickly analyze small amounts of data and turn those into charts and graphs that you can plot in your um, accompanying documents So does it uh, comply now fully with the, with the uh, updated clipboard? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, it has its own internal clipboard. So you can copy between text these documents, but it doesn't paste to the global clipboard. That makes sense. I was just thinking, it, it, this is now only on available on RISCOS rather than any other platform. Is that the, the thread of things, Rob? Yes. Yeah. Um, I've I've been trying to be respectful when working on the code of not accidentally breaking the the Windows or the Apple you know variants of the source code. Um, but I'm I'd be pretty sure that they probably don't compile anymore. Um, right. Despite my best efforts, the, the Apple Mac one, you know, I, I know the least of, in my hierarchy of how to write applications is I know more about writing risk -less applications, less about Windows, and then almost nothing about Apple Mac. Um, and I know that Apple Mac has been through, you know, so the, the contemporary Macs at the time would have been 68,000. Yeah. Yeah. Power, uh, Possibly just about nudging early power PC. Um, Possibly. Yeah. So uh, the the code and the framework that it's expecting to see is very much of that time. And I know that they've moved on a couple more times since then. Coco yeah. is a, a thing that I vaguely remember the name, hearing the name. So <laughs> yeah. uh, they've they've changed their way that the uh, the windowing stuff is done quite a few times. Same with Microsoft. You know, early two thousands. I remember doing. MFC, the Microsoft Foundation class applications. Right. Uh, and I think that got kicked into touch uh, and you can't write those anymore. You can um, still write them. Um, you can still write them. You can still write them. Okay. The, okay. I, yeah, you just need to be old. Sometimes yeah. access one API, you have to write it from a certain particular framework. Yes. Yeah. That, that was my memory. It was uh, you. You could drag and drop buttons around and things, and it, it it would have the corresponding widget, the support code for those widgets. But then, any widgets that have been added to Windows since then haven't had the corresponding updates to MFC. So, yeah. Again, it, the the Windows version of Textees will also be of its time. So I suspect. Uh, I suspect I could get it going on Windows 98 without too much trouble. <laughs> probably not get it going on Windows 10. I, I don't think that's uh, no, uh, that's no. probably not within my the bounds of my patience. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, well, really, I think you can get it running on Windows 98 or something like that, or even XP. It'll probably run on Linux as well under Wine. Oh, that's, that's yeah. true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking uh, more in the fact of we've got like Ovation and Impression, uh, which are sort of like unique apps and very lightweight, but very powerful. Uh, and I, I think, well, this is another one to throw in the, the, the corner there, you know. Uh, and I think somebody was saying on the chat, you know, so how do we get the word out that if you want something like this, you may remember it from previously, just buy a pie with risk costs on or, you know, an LSR thing if you want to go completely whizzy, obviously. Yes, yeah, I, I think um, uh, I'm, I'm conscious of not trying to overlap too much with other things. This is, it's not trying to just be a word processor. So no. you know, I, I have I have TechWriter. I love TechWriter. It's that's very much how my my brain works. I never really got on with it with impression it's for some right. reason. I've, I've tried. I've tried to like it, but uh, <laughs> I think it's probably the way around. I've come of, of doing things. I've come. I've started with Word, and I find tech writer is quite similar in its thinking to word I, c I can map between those two and when i've tried using impression that it, it just doesn't quite no. it's not not my way of thinking um i, I so, think that's yeah. a, that's a catch with software writing and user interfaces and things like mm. that that if you don't think like the programmer thought yes <laughs> you're going to be a bit stuck never catches yeah. how many ways are there of thinking yeah i would like to think 
if you think in a risk off sort of way, you sort of go, what is the rest of the computing world about? <laughs> yes. Broad rubbish, I'm afraid why, to say. Why can't I drag that from there to there? That's, that would seem the obvious thing to be able oh. to do. <laughs> I mean, when, when I say like anti alias fonts and drag and drop since 1992, you know, you sort of go, can you catch up? So, I mean, the only sort of nice thing on the horizon, sort of, uh, is of course that Macs are now all going over to ARMS. So yes. Yeah. That's They've good. Come, come full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah. I find, you know, yeah, the the risk risk way of thinking is definitely a different way of thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I wouldn't class it as, yeah, better or worse. It's just different. So oh, yeah. you know, when, when I'm in Windows and I think, well, where did the scroll bar disappear? Oh, oh you've minimized it because I moved my mouse a little bit away. I found that very odd user yeah. interface decision that. I yeah. can only see the scroll bar if I hover near the edge of the screen. It's mm -hmm. not like mm -hmm. it, the, yeah. the scroll bar doesn't take up that much space. Why don't you just leave it showing all the time? It, it's a very odd. Yeah, I, I think the guys that actually invented Briscos did a, a fantastic job because there's so little you need to change. It's sort of like twiddly bits around the edge, generally. You know. Yeah, I, I've done uh, I've done a demo for um, some people I I also work with. Um, where I've done the thing where if you right click on a scroll bar, you can scroll both scroll bars at the same time. I don't know if you right. aware of yep. that in Risk right. So you can, yeah, you, you can scroll diagonally as it were. Yes. And they're, yep. they're all like, oh, 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 that's a good idea. That's really, or, or the thing where scroll down by clicking on the bottom one or adjust yeah. click and it'll go back up. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm doing that. So, so, that uh, it's so frustrating that it's not in Windows applications. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Reverse, reverse mouse, uh, third mouse button, stuff like that. I mean, if you want to zoom into a picture, you just scroll around with your right mouse button, don't you? That's yeah. it. Yeah, and it's uh, you just not available many, on other formats. <laughs> how many, how many wasted mouse miles you end up with oh. having to having to move up to the top of the screen? We think, well, oh. I could just uh, just click and go backwards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That applies to menus as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Forever going up to the, the top of the screen, also the ribbon, I guess, in, in Word, in Office. Well, yeah, I was, I was thinking more of a just clicking on a menu item to, and the menu stays open. Yes, yes. yeah. yeah. Oh, function one, gets rid of the ribbon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Rob, I posted a question on the chat. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm screen sharing, so I can't see the questions at the moment. I see. But it was about publicity, about telling other people about beyond just the risk OS groups, how are they going to get to hear about the wonders of text ease? Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm certainly planning on uh, announcing it more widely than than today. Today was today was the reveal. Uh, it'll be uh, on the website uh, uh, later this evening, and uh, obviously I'll be announcing it to various news outlets in the next few weeks, uh, few, sorry, a few days. Um, but yes, outside the risk rest community is, is an interesting uh, question. You know, there was certainly, and I again, this is going back to the, eight, the my reference to 18 years since the last version, you know, there, there was a lot of up in arms uh, uh, when uh, RM discontinued the risk OS version. And it would be interesting to know whether, you know, for example, I'm pretty sure there's a Raspberry Pi in every school now. Um, or in every classroom, if not in every pupil's desk, um, mm. and whether this is something where um, this is this is a, a reason to, for them to go back to, or take another look at RiscOS rather than uh, rather than Linux, because you know at, at the time you know I can, if I rummage through old um, old um, is it the Bet magazine is that the one for the yeah. teachers? Yeah, Bet yeah, B E T T. Yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of people saying, oh, you've discontinued the RiskOS version. I'm going to have to buy the Windows version now. Um, so, yeah, to find out whether those uh, that interest in, in the educational arena outside of the, the usual RiskOS user groups, whether that's still there, whether people are, have uh, still got interest in t teaching. You know, it's, this, I'm this sorry. Is, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Robert. At the very least, I think it's worth a try. And obviously, Cloverleaf as well. Uh, it's getting word out, yes. uh, but I was thinking, uh, how much is PowerPoint relative to the full version where you get the presenter in? 
can't, I don't know what PowerPoint pricing is at the moment. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, office pricing is confusing because they're trying to uh, push everyone onto Office 365, the subscription. Rental, yeah. The, the <laughs> so software rental version, yeah. So um, I can't actually think when I last bought, probably the last time I bought an actual CD with Office on it was yeah. probably when XP came out. So, yeah early 2004-ish, somewhere around that kind of time. Mm. And uh, you know, it was of the order of 160, 200 pounds is my memory. But again, that's 15-year-old yeah. memory, so no, yeah. don't rely on it too heavily. So no. yeah, I, I don't Where know what- the... some student versions at 100 pounds a couple right. of years ago. Mm -hmm. so, but why would, you, why would you not use LibreOffice? Well, there's that as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you've got a pie or something diddy that you're taking around with you. So the, the disappointing thing for me is uh, there's currently not an HDMI out on the uh, wrist book or arm book, sorry. Yeah. Oh, if you wanted to project or to plug it into an yes. external TV. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, th those two would go hand in glove and, you know, annoy the world, I think. So your battery lasts <laughs> 14 hours and the program costs 100 quid and it does all this as well. Oh, <laughs> uh, just yeah. thinking of yeah. your publicity, Rob. Um, if I remember rightly, um, because they used to be able to disable certain of the modules, i.e., you could just have the DTP section, the others used to have like, almost like a limited demo type mode. Yes, so could that, that be a possibility. That's all still yeah. in there. So, yeah, if, yeah, I, I maybe didn't. Uh, didn't elicit that information when I was whizzing through the slide on the uh, on the different versions. Uh, let me find that slide again. Uh, it's that one, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So um, if you get the home edition, you can still open all of the educational and professional stuff. So if I were to send you this set of slides, you could still open that on the home edition and view it. So it, it will act as a, it, the editor works for DTP and Paint, but it will be a viewer for Turtle, Branch, Table and Presenter, if you see what I mean. Yeah, because that would be good to, you know, I'm talking about getting your own publicity out, but, you know, if, if, if it was bundled that way with some of the machine offerings. Yes, yeah, so. You know, almost like full demo mode uh, with a little couple of um, documents that demonstrates its capabilities. Equally, coming back to the pie, you, you know, um, if if there's things that are going on with the risk with the the jams at one stage, which obviously COVID has stopped, it'd be good for you to get in on the um, uh, the, the actual disc image that's handed out oh, to the jams yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I've I have um, I have mould a like a, a reader version or a demo version, as you say, of the whole thing. Um, the, the, the reason I haven't put that at the top of my uh, laundry list at the moment is that I need to check some of the, um, some of the stuff from Jeff, uh, the, the license conditions, whether I'm able to give it away. So I need to, uh, just right. able, I, I, need to I need to go back and check with him what it is that you know, whether that's possible. So it's, it's a very simple discussion to have had with him saying, well, I'll sell a home edition, uh, education edition, a pro edition. He's, oh yeah, that sounds all oh, makes sense. Yeah, so I probably need to uh, do a courteous check with um, Jeff and Danny that a, a, a reader version or a demo version is, is allowed. Along with the upgrade versions. <laughs> uh, I'll just keep quiet about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so obvious one of the other things will be to uh, obviously a, a full demo of this uh, on your website uh, so other people can uh, see what it's all about. Well, that also makes sense from the point of view of, of interchanging documents. So if yeah, if you've written a presentation as, I, as I've done here, if you want to share that with somebody at the moment, that, that person will need to also have a copy at least of um, text in the home edition. Yeah. in order that they can view your presentation. So yeah, having a, a, a reader makes sense from a, the point of view of being able to interchange documents with people who don't have texties at all. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, but obviously, if you can save as HTML, uh, any slideshow could be HTMLized for everybody else, couldn't it? Yes, there, yeah, there's yeah. that too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. Or even a, a big pile of draw files if you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that won't confuse everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? It doesn't seem to say DWF as a file type, yeah. <laughs> this is actually printed in PDF with one of the PDF tools. I'm sure it even with. Windows yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So you, it, it will print through the normal RISC-OS printer drivers. So uh, if you had a printer driver that prints, so um, Steve Fryer's print PDF, for example, yes, you could do it PDF that way. Yeah. Uh, Robert, what what export options does it have? Ah, sorry, I was that uh, a little bit earlier. So uh, for the main across there so there's 10 icons under each of the save boxes um but which ones are enabled depends on which section you're in so yeah, for the main dtp for when you're writing documents this first one is in its native format so that's just a, as a textease file the next one along is a textease but as a template so in other words you design a template with a header or a footer or something like that and then in future that can be used as the basis of a new document plain text, draw, draw where the text has been exported as a text area, and therefore you can go back in and still edit the text in draw, and then HTML. Okay, thanks. Whereas if I were to go into the, if I were to create a, um, oh, sorry. Actually, we can get it a different way. It's just. Uh, If I then try and save from the paint program, a few more of the buttons have lit up at the bottom so that you can save as Sprite, uh, as a JPEG, okay, yeah, so a I'm Windows bitmap. So you know, it's in the, the con which file formats you can save as depend on the context in which you're using it. So uh, saving it as a, uh, saving a letter as a, a Windows bitmap doesn't really make sense, whereas saving a painting does. Are there, are there save icons? got uh, help text associated uh, yeah so there's help i'm not sure why i'm pointing in a monitor you can't see so in the top left hand corner uh, <laughs> over here there's a ribbon there's a there's a ribbon where there's interactive text as as you move your mouse around so if i go back across ribbon you say <laughs> yeah a, rib, a ribbon of help text <laughs> an, an a line of information uh, yeah, that's 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 rather a long way away. I was more thinking more of the sort of context type pop up help, which the help applications uh, normally provide. Right. You mean uh, through RiskOS help, right? Need help. Yeah. Yeah. I must confess, I haven't tried doing that on that menu, but let's let's give it a go. Yes, <laughs> answers that question. You could. Yeah. I think uh, I also saw Speak Help as well there. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's got pretty good integration with Speak. And I know I mentioned that earlier for if you wanted to proofread something. Um, but yes, you can turn <coughs> on, uh, you can get it to speak, you can get it to speak words as you click on them. It's, it's really quite well integrated. And I guess that's partly because it, it's educational background. If you have a word list, uh, you would be able to have someone learn the sound or you know, repeat the sound back um, afterwards but yeah it's also useful for um, generally within use generally within the application So are you uh, all hoping that the uh, the club will be able to meet up in the sports facility in this in the sports venue again next year sometime? 
Possibly. <laughs> Everything's so uncertain at the moment that, um, yeah, who knows? Um, very late, very late Christmas meal, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, so you have to it, sort it, bring your leftovers. I mean, out on the hockey pitch at the side. The way yeah. the way forward might be a mixture of Zoom meetings and physical ones. Yeah, but the physical oh, okay. one, Christmas barbecue would be nice. That would be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've certainly thought about that um, as well, at Mug about um, you know, sort of like as you said, mixing. Uh, real and uh, you know uh, Zoom type uh, meetings because you know obviously we meet on a Saturday, uh, but again you know when you try and get speakers it's 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 difficult for the speakers really, uh, so it's sort of aids where you you can get a greater greater number of potential speakers um, that they've got valuable time. Um, um, you know that they can spare themselves as well by not coming to a to a face to face. Uh, but of course, you know you still still have that issue that uh, Zoom's great, but you still can't meet. You know, actually being in a physical room with people, I guess. Yes, when I, yeah. I when I originally uh, uh, spoke to Rick back in February, and I was planning what I might talk about in June before that got cancelled. You know, I was thinking. <laughs> thinking of things you know like demoing the, the raspberry pi hat so trying to it, it's a lot easier to show that or a lot more impressive to show that in if you turn up in a, in a sports hall in the middle of uh, yorkshire and plug it all together it all works it's um obviously i could do lots of smoke and mirrors um mm -hmm. via zoom where i could pretend it was doing something and sh share a different screen <laughs> entirely <laughs> so uh, yeah being able to meet, meet up in person uh, on one of their demos. <laughs> well, yes, the, the, the advantage for us, of course, of the Zoom meetings is a, a far, not only a wider pool of speakers, um, but um, more people are able to participate. I mean, there's there's 42 yes, this people evening. Outside. Now, admittedly, a lot are not rock members, but that's not important. Um, but we wouldn't get 42 at one of our meetings physically, I can assure you. <clears throat> There was a time when we did years ago in the BBC days, you get about 100 or something. Yeah. And I think about publicity. If these are recorded and the recordings are made available, then yeah. you've got a potential worldwide audience, haven't you? Yeah. We've added now, we've, um, it, we've sort of um, taken the leaf out of Rugel's book here. And on our website now, if you look at the meetings page, it will show you the links to videos of recent meetings. Good. Yes. I put up some uh, a couple of mentions about mag uh, educational magazines and things like that, and other uh, distributions which might include some form of perhaps read-only taxis or even the full version. I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, no, that, I'll, I'm going to hastily copy those out of the, uh, the chat window so I don't lose them. Stick them in there. Oops. Well, they, they, they'll be saved as a text file when the video is saved at the end. So I can email you that if you want. Save you the bother. I grabbed them. <laughs> Somebody might add more. Yes, mm. yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, sh shouting about all the, these uh, jewels in our crown that only we we look at, and, and we're we're busy polishing our own crowns, but never showing them off in uh, public. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if there's some opportunity to um, to get the word out a bit further, that's that's all good. Yeah. They've all gone very quiet. <laughs> Answered all the questions. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, just at this point, um, uh, well, people can ask more questions if they want, but just to say thank you for all of those who've uh, attended. It was 42, two have sloped off for their supper. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's nice to see so many faces, some of which are familiar, some not. Um, and it's, um, yeah, doesn't really matter where you are, you can join in the meeting. Okay, well, thanks to everybody from me. And I think I will uh, say cheerio, good night. Yep, thank All you. Right. Good night, Bernard. My bird. Nighty night.
God push Good off. night. Have a good Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is cancelled, I'm afraid. No, you can't good cancel it. Three. But is your next meeting in, in January then, Rick? Or well, um, officially, or no. Our next one's in February, and that's actually a, a AGM, so that will be members only. But uh, okay. if, I can, if we can find some speakers, then we might have a, an extra meeting in January. Because before this COVID business um, came along, we decided to go to bi-monthly meetings. So on the, yes, just I on the even we numbered were, months. But, when we were uh, booking for June, yeah. Um, but COVID has changed things. Sometimes some things are the worst, but not all. Um, so, yeah, if we can find something for January, then, yeah, we'll, we'll do something. Um, Oddly enough, we, we've, we're in bi-month. <coughs> we need to COVID, but we um, went to the monthly as soon as it, we got the Zoom going. Yeah, that's uh, rather curious. Yeah, yeah. So we're sort of committed to bi-monthly meetings, but if we have some fill-in, we can do some fill-in ones when we shall. The more, the merrier. Yeah, and more people can get to the meetings this way as well. So. Yeah, I so say it's it's the pool of speakers that's the the, the critical thing. You, doesn't matter where you are in the world. Uh, the last potpourri, there was uh, Rob Coleman in South Wales, and there was Andy Vaughan in. Chichester, I think it is, and uh, Steve Fry up in Leeds. I think there was somebody from Russia and somebody from America as well. Uh, at one point, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, in the audience, yes, not speaking. At a recent Rugal meeting, we had a speaker from Thailand. It was uh, it was well past his bedtime. Uh, oh, golly, yes, it would be. I um, On a Saturday morning, I have a Zoom chat with um, some former colleagues of mine, one of whom is in Thailand, and uh, for us, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and I think it's about 5 or 6 in the afternoon to him. Mm -hmm. And we moved it from 11 till 10, because then he can slope off to the pub afterwards, <laughs> which is called the Red Lion in Chiang Mai, if you're ever in Chiang Mai. Um, Rob, somebody's just asking on the chat, is there, are there any different hats for the pie coming? Yes, I was just uh, just looking at that. Um, so at the moment, the ones that uh, LSR uh sell are the wi-fi hat and the serial and parallel hat so that adds a 25 pin parallel port um which in fact i came when i was at the uh, wakefield last in person uh, i showed the um the parallel port hat um which often people will use that for using strange industrial control it's nothing to do with actually printing out sheets of paper anymore the 25 pin parallel port is is used quite a lot for um, yeah, various bits of industrial control and CNCs, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's a serial port and nine pin D sub. So I should say that the ideas for both of those, both the, the serial and parallel hat and the, the uh, Wi-Fi hat, both came from suggestions from people. So I'm, I'm always listening out for and always uh, eager to hear if somebody can think of a hat that doesn't yet exist that could reasonably exist you know it has a um has a a useful market it's not not just a super specific like you you want a, uh, a laser range finder hat or something like that and you think well that's 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 a pretty narrow sure. niche par na very narrow niche but yeah in in general terms um uh, damn one, no, one, no chance of a dmx hat then well yeah dmx is just a is it five twelve killer board uh oh, rs485 for a second there <laughs> it's just an rs485 bus isn't it uh, with a strange board rate it's my memory of dmx yeah something yeah, like that I that's what it is yeah so uh i I'd, I'd imagine somebody might have done an rs485 hat already that that sounds like something that probably exists um you might need some weird line drivers for dmx but i'd be pretty sure someone's done something rs485 -y. So that's very common bus in industrial control. Um, so yeah, um, in general, you know, LSR uh, always tries to uh, listen out for and blatantly steal people's ideas that are suggested in this in this way. So your know, profit came from uh, that was some Jim Nagel kept suggesting it to me every time I saw him. He would kept suggesting it. So uh, LSR took on profit. Uh, the Wi-Fi hat came from a suggestion from, I think that might have been from the London show or one of the people from the London user group. 
uh, and the serial and parallel hat also came from a suggestion from a user group. So yeah, I, I uh, always ears wide open to suggestions. So, so with um, work going on um, with the uh, sound API, so would that be a possibility for a, a hat going forward? Uh, yes, well, there are already um, ADC and DAC hats available. So, um, you know, for doing surround 5.1 surround sound and that sort of thing, they definitely exist. Because uh, I looked at one of the chipsets for that. Um, generally, the way that they've tackled it, though, is they they choose a chipset from something like a laptop. And so the chipset is really it's doing USB. So it's uh, the um, the serial and parallel hat genuinely uses so if it's a 25 pin parallel port it genuinely uses 25 it's probably not it's quite a, bit, a bit less than that but, you know it's 20 ish gpio pins so i'm i'm using uh the gpio 40 pin gpio header as uh you know the main thing that's driving that and similarly with the um the wi-fi hat that uses one of the spi buses which comes out on the 40 pin gpio header as well so um but yeah. the, uh, I was the thinking audio. more of um, sound input because Jason is working on the the API. So okay, yeah. So in that for sound uh, input, yeah, um, there are they they do exist already, and I know that on the Pi, some of the GPIO header pins I don't remember which um, is an audio input bus. It's a slightly non-standard one, but I've forgotten uh, uh, forgotten the name of the bus. So. I squared S is a very common output bus. Um, so I squared S is short for inter IC sound. There's an input version of that bus for recording, and I can't remember what the bus is called, but that comes out on one of the headers somewhere. So I suspect that the hats that I'm, I'm aware that exist with microphones on them uh, uh, are, are using that bus probably. So yes, that exists and it would be a matter of writing all of the corresponding software drivers and then it would only work with pi as well yeah i'll take it the parallel course is bi-directional yes yeah um, on, on it yeah so, so, yep. so if you've got an old scanner yeah. uh yeah so the uh the, for the risk os version the api it presents is the parallel SWIs like the RISC PC had? So um, uh, I know Doug, you wouldn't have been at the Wakefield show, uh, Wakefield Club when I was last there showing it. Um, but the um, PIC programmer tools that I was demoing uh, when I was last up in Wakefield, which go through the parallel port, uses oh, the God. it uses the exact same driver as I wrote on the RISC PC. So uh, you you open. The parallel port using the parallel SWIs, uh, and the the application level is not aware of the fact that actually it's now running on a Raspberry Pi on a hat. It doesn't know that um, because the SWIs are the same. So yes, if you had a scanner that uses the legal or you know, all of the parallel SWIs, then that would work fine. The qualifier I'm adding there is that what they might have done. I I'm, I don't know for a particular scanner. Uh, they might have tried accessing the parallel pins directly on the RISC PC for speed, and that won't work. So but it, would the software you use to run your scanner on the RISC PC, that wouldn't be 32-bit necessarily, would it? So you couldn't get the thing to work. Uh, I was assuming you're using David Pilling's uh, Image Master, or the, the thing oh, right, yeah. previously known, and, and there's a 32-bit version of Image Master, or oh, Deep, right. Deepling's Scan, as it's now known. But uh, yeah, yeah, image, yeah, there's a 32-bit Image Master, and the Twain drivers are also 32-bit. Oh, so, right, that um, well. there's, there's no particular issue there, but it's whether the drivers would, for speed, they might have been directly yeah. accessing the RISC PC's there hardware, and, and that won't work anymore on a Pi. Right. We're talking a printer. I've got my brand new shiny Pi 4. Um, I'm still trying to work out how to get printing working. It came with a RISC-OS 5 manual, but that still mentions parallel and serial ports and things. So I'm still trying to figure out how to get 
USB. Well, it sees my printers, but I can't do anything with them, as it were. Is there yes. a sort of repository of information for this somewhere? Yeah, so if you've got a, um, uh, a USB uh, printer, then if you plug it into, uh, if you run Printer Manager first, and then plug the printer into uh, the Pi, it will pop up a dialog box saying that there's a new printer attached. And if it knows the type of printer and it has a small database of, of known printers, um, it will automatically guess which printer definition file you need. Uh -huh. what, it won't, what it won't do is if it doesn't, if it hasn't seen that printer before, it doesn't know about it. It'll just uh, it'll just present you a, a box saying, "What do you want me to do?" and then shr shrug its metaphorical shoulders at you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, certainly no PDFs in the list of PDFs that come with it. So yeah, uh, I'm just quickly going to look on my. Uh, do you know what printer it is off the top of your head? Well, I've got two. I've got a I've got a Dell laser printer, and an HP DeskJet. Uh, ah, let me. Uh, it's going to be unlucky there. See that no, the Dell works with the, see if the I can printer share my port screen. on the Rich PC. That's no problem. But the driver I used for that, it, it wouldn't recognise. Five two eight wouldn't recognise that. Yeah, it's my uh, printer. So I have an EPL fifty eight hundred print. That's the only printer that's real. Uh, is and that's a, a USB printer um, and then these other two are ones that pr only print a file so if you go to install new printer it will show you all of the printer definitions that it knows about so right. you said you had an hp yeah desk jet 400 i forgot I've forgotten already. oh no this is this is a hang on i never remember this five six ten so it's a four figure one and there aren't any four figure ones in the list Oh, okay, right. Okay, so it's a one that's newer than the printer definitions. Yeah, that's that, right. Yeah. Do you have? And the Dell the printer even definition. Listen. Sorry. Do you do you still have the printer definition that you used when it was on the RISC PC? No, I never did get that working. But the Dell oh, okay, um, right. laser printer I got working. But I tried the same printer driver on the um, Pi, and it just fell over. Wouldn't recognise it. I've got a 12-year-old desk jet here, and that's a four-digit number. So, well, have you got a driver for it, then? No, I'm not using under risk OS. No, that's, what, no, that's the problem, yeah. Yeah, but it is a four-figure one, so you'd think yeah. they would have some four-figure ones there because they're not necessarily only the later printers. It's worth um, just checking the, the stack to see whether... Um, um, PCL or wherever um, compatible. Because yeah, quite often. Maybe I to use a, a Quite often, the the generic printer drivers will work. So that my Epson uh, laser printer isn't actually using the, the you know a, a custom written driver. It, it's merely one that was near enough, that was close enough that I've renamed to be an e, EPL fifty eight hundred. Um, so. I've opened up on my screen. Hopefully, I'm, I'm sharing that again. Yeah, where did you get that list and from? So, uh, I, I don't know where your printer definitions are stored on your computer. So, mine are in boot resources print defs. There's a file called USB map. And all this right. does is it, it maps the USB device and vendor ID numbers to the Scott correspondingly named printer definition. So you'll, so, you'll see for some of them. Oh, yeah. You'll see for some of them, uh, the printer definition isn't actually, so the one that I've highlighted there is not really an HP printer driver at all. Uh, as we were saying a moment ago, the generic driver will often, often do the trick. Oh, yeah. So that, that HP one that I've, I've highlighted, I don't know what an 03F0417 oh, is. Seven. It's just, not... it's whatever the, the hex number of the, whatever the yeah. um, product and vendor ID number was, but all it does is it maps it to the PostScript driver. So if I did own that printer and I plugged it in, printer manager would pop up the dialog box and say, oh, yes, I, oh, yeah. I recognize that printer and I'll use the PostScript driver. So you'll probably find, yeah, there's, there's not a huge database of uh, known printers, but um, if you can find a generic driver that uh, that's supported by the 
printer languages that your printer supports, uh, then you can add it to the, the oh, USB right. map and it will know about it in future. All right, that's useful. Thanks, I'll give it a try. So I didn't know where that list came from. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Now. Yeah, I mean, if it's not in that list, that, that's not a showstopper. All that happens is you get a dialog box that pops up and says, I've no idea what this printer is, what yeah. you want me to do with it. And you then have to manually select one, but you can skip that step by adding it to your USB map. Right. I got that PostScript 3 printer string from Martin Werdner. I tried to get that work. It didn't recognize anything. But maybe I've set it up incorrectly. I'll work on it. Yeah. Um, uh, Was it P PS3? Uh, so I've, I've um, just wanted to show you where these uh, magic hex numbers come from. Uh, I don't know. Let's pick my mouse. There we go. So uh, my, my printer is not plugged in at the moment. So, um, so the vendor ID, that number there, I scroll back up the vendor id and the product id that's those eight that's where yeah, those yeah. eight digit numbers come from which end up in your printer's usb map so if you plug your printer in and type usb dev info on on whichever thing is to your usb printer you can then get the eight digit number which you need to paste into into your usb map oh right so it, that will that will then associate the two so when it then sees that printer plugged in it will know to go and get that printer definition all oh, right so i could try the postscript 2 ones that might be the nearest wouldn't it Ooh. yeah i mean a lot of a lot of modern printers because processors are processors and memory are so cheap now a lot of modern printers will support all all kinds of different languages so although mine's an epson printer you know a, a modern uh, HP printer probably also supports Epson page description just the same because why wouldn't you it's you know yeah stick it in <laughs> it doesn't cost anything now, if, they put, if they put that in the H, the risk cost five manual I wouldn't have been faffing around asking people questions yeah, say if you if sorry, sorry? So it's worth saying if you're using PostScript 3 on your RISC PC, it'll work fine on RISC OS 5 um, because I use it all the time for printing stuff. Right. Um, you have you have ensured that you've actually got the application seen before you try and do anything with the printer definition. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll keep work working on it. It works fine on RISC OS 5 because it's used to generate the club newsletter every month. So. Oh right. I must be doing something wrong somewhere then. Right. No change there then. If there's any error messages, let us know what, you know, maybe ask the Cloud Forum or something, let us know what the mess error messages are and we'll try and help because it, oh, right. it works fine or it should do. <laughs> right. As long as the error messages aren't, there's been an unexpected error, <laughs> unknown <laughs> error. <laughs> Printer not found is my favourite one. And you, the solution to that is you, you move the monitor so that the monitor can see the printer and it's fine then. <laughs> 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 Very good. I believe that's an old uh, techie fix, isn't it? Not seen by, yeah. Right. Sounds like we've pretty well wound up. I I can't close the meeting, but Ruth can. She, Why would I do a thing like that? She because you have the power. <laughs> anyway. Thanks everyone for coming and participating. Yes, thank you. Very nice. Yeah. Enjoyed, nice enjoyed it. Them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for having me. Remember the recording. By, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, was it nice to be had? <laughs> A special thanks to Rob, of course. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, okay. Thank you, Rob. All went very well. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Yep. So it, this the video for this will probably take until gone midnight to uh, to convert. <laughs> it did last time. It took hours. <laughs> God knows what it's converting it from. Perhaps it's batching it slowly from one server to another and they're in opposite sides of the planet or something well, like the, that. Yeah, anything's possible, I suppose. It takes a very long time. It's those little notes in the camera, they've got to get the paint all, all mixed up and ready. <laughs> yeah. So can you do the, uh, would you like to exterminate us, Ruth?
Yes, I shall do that. Thank you very kindly. Just make it swift and merciful. Swift and merciful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the Doctor Who yeah. sound effect. Recording exterminate, saying. exterminate. <laughs> <laughs> Night, everyone, and the, uh, the Night, everybody. as soon as possible. So, yeah. um, we'll restart. see you jumping into the TARDIS, Will. Yeah, we should Thank really you. start worrying if she offers to upgrade you. <laughs> <laughs> On Teletop land. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.